This is an audio recording of the Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian by Sherman Alexi. Make sure that you're either following along in your own copy of the book or on this screen so that you can look at the images that will not be described, such as the one right here. Chapter 6, Go Means Go. After Mr. P left, I sat on the porch for a long time and thought about my life. What the heck was I supposed to do? I felt like life had just knocked me on my ass. I was so happy when Mom and Dad got home from work. Hey, little man, Dad said. Hey, Dad, Mom. Junior, why are you looking so sad? Mom asked. She knew stuff. I didn't know how to start, so I just started with the biggest question. Who has the most hope? I asked. Mom and Dad looked at each other. They studied each other's eyes, you know, like they had antennas and were sending radio signals to each other. And then they both looked back at me. Come on, I said. Who has the most hope? White people, my parents said at the same time. That's exactly what I thought they were going to say. So I said the most surprising thing, surprising thing they'd ever heard from me. I want to transfer schools, I said. You want to go to Hunter's, Mom said. It's another school on the west end of the reservation, filled with poor Indians and poorer white kids. Yes, there is a place in the world where the white people are poorer than the Indians. No, I said. You want to go to Springdale? Dad asked. It's a school on the reservation border filled with the poorest Indians and the poorer than poorest white kids. Yes, there is a place in the world where the white people are even poorer than you ever thought possible. I want to go to Reardon, I said. Reardon is the rich white farm town that sits in the wheat fields exactly 22 miles away from the res. And it's a hick town, I suppose, filled with farmers and ragnecks and racist cops who stop every Indian that drives through. During one week when I was little, Dad got stopped three times for DWI, driving while Indian. But... Reardon has one of the best small schools in the state, with a computer room and huge chemistry lab and a drama club and two basketball gyms. The kids in Reardon are the smartest and most athletic kids anywhere. They are the best. I want to go to Reardon, I said again. I couldn't believe I was saying it. For me, it seemed as real as saying I want to fly to the moon. Are you sure? My parents asked. Yes, I said. When do you want to go? My parents asked. Right now, I said. Tomorrow. Are you sure? My parents asked. You could maybe wait until the semester break or until next year. Get a fresh start. No, if I don't go now, I will never go. I have to do it now. Okay, they said. Yep, it was that easy with my parents. It was almost like they'd been waiting for me to ask them if I could go to Reardon, like they were psychics or something. I mean, they've always known that I'm weird and ambitious, so maybe they expect me to do the weirdest things possible. And going to Reardon is truly a strange idea. But it isn't weird that my parents so quickly agreed with my plans. They want a better life for my sister and me. My sister is running away to get lost, but I am running away because I want to find something. And my parents love me so much that they want to help me. Yeah, Dad's a drunk and Mom is an ex-drunk, but they don't want their kids to be drunks. It's going to be hard to get to Reardon, Dad said. We can't afford to move there, and there ain't no school bus going to come out here. You'll be the first one to ever leave the res this way, Mom said. The Indians around here are going to be angry with you. Shoot, I figure that my fellow tribal members are going to torture me. This is an audio recording of The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian by Sherman Alexi. Be sure to read or watch along so you can see the images that will not be described. Chapter 7, Rowdy Sings the Blues. So the day after I decided to transfer to Reardon, and after my parents agreed to make it happen, I walked over to the tribal school and found Rowdy sitting in his usual place on the playground. He was alone, of course. Everybody was scared of him. I thought you weren't a suspension, dickwad, he said, which was Rowdy's way of saying, I'm happy you're here. Kiss my ass, I said. I wanted to tell him that he was my best friend and I loved him like crazy, but boys didn't say such things to other boys, and nobody said such things to Rowdy. Can I tell you a secret? I asked. Better not be girly, he said. It's not. 
Okay, then tell me. I'm transferring to Reardon. Rowdy's eyes narrowed. His eyes always narrowed, right before he beat the crap out of someone. I started shaking. That's not funny, he said. It's not supposed to be funny, I said. I'm transferring to Reardon. I want you to come with me. And when are you going on this imaginary journey? It's not imaginary, it's real, and I'm transferring now. I start school tomorrow at Reardon. You better quit saying that, he said. You're getting me mad. I didn't want to get him mad. When Rowdy got mad, it got him, it took days to get him unmad. But he was my best friend and wanted him, I wanted him to know the truth. I'm not trying to get you mad, I said. I'm telling the truth. I'm leaving the res, man, and I want you to come with me. Come on, it'll be an adventure. I don't even drive through that town, he said. What makes you think I want to go to school there? He got up, stared me hard in the eyes, and then spit on the floor. Last year, during 8th grade, we traveled to Reardon to play them in flag football. Rowdy was our star quarterback and kicker and middle linebacker, and I was the loser water boy, and we lost to Reardon by a score of 45-0. Of course, losing isn't exactly fun. Nobody wants to be a loser. We all got really mad and vowed to kick their asses the next game. But two weeks after that, Reardon came to the res and beat us 56-10. During basketball season, Reardon beat us 72-5 and 86-50, our only two losses of the season. Rowdy scored 24 points in the first game and 40 in the second game. I scored 9 points in each game, going 3 for 10 on 3 pointers in the first game and 3 for 15 in the second. Those were my two worst games of the season. During baseball season, Rowdy hit three home runs in the first game against Reardon and two home runs in the second, but we still lost by scores of 17-3 and 12-2. I played in both losses and struck out seven times and was hit by a pitch once. Sad thing is, getting hit like that was the only hit of the season. After baseball season, I led the Welpinit Junior High Academic Bowl team against Reardon Junior High, and we lost by a grand total of 50 to 1. Yep, we answered one question correctly. I was the only kid, white or Indian, who knew that Charles Dickens wrote A Tale of Two Cities, and let me tell you, we Indians were the worst of times, and those Reardon kids were the best of times. Those kids were magnificent. They knew everything. And they were beautiful. They were beautiful and smart. They were beautiful and smart and epic. They were filled with hope. I don't know if hope is white, but I do know that hope for us is like some mythical creature. Man, I was scared of those weird kids, and maybe I was scared of hope too. But Rowdy absolutely hated all of it. Rowdy, I said, I'm going to Reardon tomorrow. For the first time, he saw that I was serious, but he didn't want me to be serious. You'll never do it, he said. You're too scared. I'm going, I said. No way. You're a wuss. I'm doing it. You're a pussy. I'm going to Reardon tomorrow. You're really serious? Rowdy, I said. I'm as serious as a tumor. He coughed and turned away from me. I touched his shoulder. Why did I touch his shoulder? I don't know. I was stupid. Rowdy spun around and shoved me. Don't touch me, you retarded fag, he yelled. My heart broke into 14 pieces, one for each year that Rowdy and I had been best friends. I started crying. That wasn't surprising at all, but Rowdy started crying too, and he hated it. He wiped his eyes, stared at his wet hand, and screamed. I'm sure that everybody on the red res heard that scream. It was the worst thing I've ever heard. It was pain. Pure pain. Rowdy, I'm sorry, I said. I'm sorry. He kept screaming. You can still come with me, I said. You're still my best friend. Rowdy stopped screaming with his mouth, but he kept screaming with his eyes. You always thought you were better than me, he yelled. No, no, I don't think I'm better than anybody. I think I'm worse than everybody else. Why are you leaving? I have to go. I'm going to die if I don't leave. I touched his shoulder again and Rowdy flinched. Yes, I touched him again. What kind of idiot was I? I was the kind of idiot that got punched hard in the face by his best friend. Bang! Rowdy punched me. Bang! I hit the ground. Bang! 
My nose bled like a firework. I stayed on the ground for a long time after Rowdy walked by. I stupidly hoped that time would stand still if I stayed still. But I had to stand eventually, and when I did, I knew that my best friend had become my worst enemy. Audio recording of The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian by Sherman Alexi. This is Chapter 8. Make sure you read along in your book. How to Fight Monsters The next morning, Dad drove me the 22 miles to Reardon. I'm scared, I said. I'm scared too, Dad said. He hugged me close. His breath smelled like mouthwash and lime vodka. You don't have to do this, he said. You can always go back to the res school. No, I said, I have to do this. Can you imagine what would have happened to me if I'd hinted around and gone back to the res school? I would have been pummeled, mutilated, crucified. You can't just betray your tribe and then change your mind ten minutes later. I was on a one-way bridge. There was no way to turn around even if I wanted to. Just remember this, my father said. Those white people aren't better than you. But he was wrong. And he knew he was wrong. He was the loser Indian father of a loser Indian son, living in a world built by built for winners. But he loved me so much. He hugged me even closer. This is a great thing, he said. You're so brave. You're a warrior. It was the best thing he could have said. Hey, here's some lunch money, he said and handed me a dollar. We were poor enough to get free lunch, but I didn't want to be the only Indian and a sad sack who needed charity. Thanks, Dad, I said. I love you, he said. I love you, too. I felt stronger, so I stepped out of the car and walked to the front door. <sighs> it was locked. So I stood alone on the sidewalk and watched my father drive away. I hoped he'd drive right home and not stop in a bar and spend whatever money he had left. I hoped he'd remember to come back and pick me up after school. I stood alone at the front door for a few very long minutes. It was still early and I had a black eye from Rowdy's goodbye punch. No, I had a purple, blue, yellow, and black eye. It looked like modern art. Then the white kids began arriving for school. They surrounded me. Those kids weren't just white, they were translucent. I could see the blue veins running through their skin like rivers. Most of the kids were my size or smaller, but there were 10 or 12 monster dudes, giant white guys. They looked like men, not boys. They had to be seniors. Some of them looked like they had to shave two or three times a day. They stared at me, the Indian boy with the black eye and swollen nose, my going away gifts from Rowdy. Those white kids couldn't believe their eyes. They stared at me like I was Bigfoot or a UFO. What was I doing at Reardon? Whose mascot was an Indian, thereby making me the only other Indian in town? So, what was I doing in racist Reardon, where more than half of every graduating class went to college? Nobody in my family had ever gone near a college. Reardon was the opposite of the res. It was the opposite of my family. It was the opposite of me. I didn't deserve to be there. I knew it. All of those kids knew it. Indians, Indians don't deserve shit. You can pause here if you need more time. So, feeling worthless and stupid, I just waited. And pretty soon, a janitor opened the front door and all of the other kids strolled inside. I stayed outside. Maybe I could just drop out of school completely. I could go live in the woods like a hermit, like a real Indian. Of course, since I was allergic to pretty much every plant that grew on Earth, I would have to be a real Indian with a head full of snot. Okay, I said to myself, here I go. I walked into the school, made my way to the front office, and told them who I was. Oh, you're the one from the reservation, the secretary said. Yeah, I said. I couldn't tell if she thought the reservation was a good or bad thing. My name is Melinda, she said. Welcome to Reardon High School. Here's your schedule, a copy of the school constitution and moral code, and a temporary student ID. We've got you assigned to Mr. Grant for homeroom. You better hustle on down there. You're late. Uh, 
where's that? I asked. We've only got one hallway here, she said and smiled. She had red hair and green eyes and was kind of sexy for an old woman. It's all the way down on the left. I shoved the paperwork into my backpack and hustled down to my homeroom. I paused a second at the door and then walked inside. Everybody, all the students and the teacher, stopped to stare at me. They stared hard, like I was bad weather. Take your seat, the teacher said. He was a muscular guy. I walked down the aisle and sat in the back row and tried to, uh, tried something, all the stares and whispers, until a blonde girl leaned toward me. Penelope! Yes, there are places left in the world where people are named Penelope. I was emotionally erect. What's your name? Penelope asked. Junior, I said. She laughed and told her girlfriend at the next desk that my name was Junior. They both laughed. Words spread around the room and pretty soon everybody was laughing. They were laughing at my name. I had no idea that Junior was a weird name. It's a common name on my res, on any res. You walked into any trading post, any res in the United States and shout, Hey Junior, and 17 guys will turn around. And three women. But there are, were no other people named Jun Junior in Reardon. So I was being laughed at because I was the only one who had that silly name. And then I felt smaller because the teacher was taking role and he called out my name name. Arnold Spirit, the teacher said. No, he yelled it. He was so big and muscular that his whisper was probably a scream. Here, I said as quietly as possible. My whisper was only a whisper. Speak up, the teacher said. Here, I said. My name is Mr. Grant, he said. I'm here, Mr. Grant. He moved on to the other students, but Penelope leaned over toward me again. But she wasn't laughing at me at all. She was mad now. I thought you said your name was Junior, Penelope said. She accused me of telling her my real name. Well, okay, it wasn't completely my real name. My full name is Arnold Spirit Junior, but nobody calls me that. Everybody calls me Junior. Well, every other Indian calls me Junior. My name is Junior, I said, and my name is Arnold. It's Junior and Arnold, I'm both. I felt like two different people inside of one body. No, I felt like a magician slicing myself in half, with Junior living on the north side of the Spokane River and Arnold living in the south. Where are you from? she asked. She was so pretty, and her eyes were so blue. I was suddenly aware that she was the prettiest girl I'd ever seen up close. She was movie star pretty. Hey, she said. I asked where you were from. Wow, she was tough. Well, it, I said. Up on the res, I mean, the reservation. Oh, she said. That's why you talk so funny. And yes, th I had that stutter and lisp, but I also had that sing-song reservation accent that made everything I said sound like a bad poem. Man, I was freaked. I didn't say another word for six days. And on the seventh day, I got into the weirdest fit fight of my life. But before I tell you about the weirdest fist fight of my life, I have to tell you. The unofficial and unwritten, but you better follow them or you're going to get beaten twice as hard, Spokane Indian rules of fisticuffs. One, if somebody insults you, then you have to fight them. Two, if you think somebody is going to insult you, then you have to fight them. Three, if you think somebody is thinking about insulting you, then you have to fight them. Four, if somebody insults any of your family or friends, or if you think they're going to insult your family or friends, or if you think they're thinking about insulting your family or friends, then you have to fight them. Five, you should never fight a girl. Unless she insults you, your family, or your friends, then you have to fight her. Six, if somebody beats up your father or your mother, then you have to fight the son and or daughter of the person who beat up your mother or father. Seven, if your mother or father beats somebody up, then that person's son and or daughter will fight you. Eight, you must always pick fights with the sons and or daughters of any Indians who work for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Nine, you must always pick fights with the sons and or daughters of any white people who live anywhere on the reservation. 10. 
If you get in a fight with somebody who is sure to beat you up, then you must throw the first punch because it's the only punch you'll ever get to throw. 11. In any fight, the loser is the first one who cries. I knew those rules. I'd memorized those rules. I'd lived my life by those rules. I got into my first fist fight when I was three years old, and I'd been in dozens since. My all-time record was five wins and 112 losses. Yes, I was a terrible fighter. I was a human punching bag. I lost fights to boys, girls, and kids half my age. One bully, Micah, made me beat up myself. Yes, he made me punch myself in the face three times. I'm the only Indian in the history of the world who ever lost a fight with himself. Okay, so now you know about the rules. Then I can tell you that I went from being a small target in Welpinit to being a larger target in Reardon. Well, let's get something straight. All of those pretty, 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 pretty white girls ignored me. But that was okay. Indian girls ignored me too, so I was used to it. And let's face it, most of the white boys ignored me too. But there were a few of those Reardon boys, the big jocks, who paid special attention to me. None of these guys punched me or got violent. After all, I was a reservation Indian, and no matter how geeky and weak I appeared to be, I was still a potential killer. So mostly, they called me names. Lots of names. And yeah, those were bad enough names. But I could handle them, especially when some huge monster boy was insulting me. But I knew I'd have to put a stop to it eventually, or I'd always be known as Chief or Tonto or Squaw Boy. But I was scared. I wasn't scared of fist fighting with those boys. I'd been in plenty of fights, and I wasn't scared of losing fights with them either. I'd lost most every fight I'd been in. I was afraid those monsters were going to kill me. And I don't mean kill as in metaphor. I mean kill as in beat me to death. So, weak and poor and scared, I let them call me names while I tried to figure out what to do. And it might have continued that way if Roger the Giant hadn't taken it too far. It was lunchtime and I was standing outside by the weird sculpture that was supposed to be an Indian. I was studying the sky like I was an astronomer, except it was daytime and I didn't have a telescope. So I was just an idiot. Roger the Giant and his gang of giants strutted over to me. Hey, Chief, Roger said. It seemed like he was seven feet tall and 300 pounds. He was a farm boy who carried squealing pigs around like they were already thin slices of bacon. I stared at Roger and tried to look tough. I read once that you can scare away a charging bear if you wave your arms and look big. But I figured I'd just look like a terrified idi idiot having an arm seizure. Hey, Chief, Roger said. You'll want to hear a joke? Sure, I said. Did you know that Indians are living proof that niggers fuck buffalo? I felt like Roger had kicked me in the face. That was the most racist thing I'd ever heard in my life. Roger and his friends were laughing like crazy. I hated them. And I knew I had to do something big. I couldn't let him get away with that shit. I wasn't just defending myself. I was defending Indians, black people, and buffalo. So I punched Roger in the face. He wasn't laughing when he landed on his ass. And he wasn't laughing when his nose bled like red fireworks. I struck some fake karate pose because I figured Roger's gang was going to attack me for bloodying their leader. They just stared at me. They were shocked. You punched me, Roger said. His voice was thick with blood. I can't believe you punched me. He sounded insulted. He sounded like his poor little feelings had been hurt. I couldn't believe it. He acted like he was the one who'd been wronged. You're an animal, he said. I felt brave all of a sudden. Yeah, maybe it was just a stupid and immature schoolyard fight. Or maybe it was the most important moment of my life. Maybe I was telling the world that I was no longer a human target. You meet me after school here, right na right here, I said. Why? he asked. I couldn't believe he was so stupid. Because we're going to finish this fight. You're crazy, Roger said. He got to his feet and walked away. His gang stared at me like I was a serial killer. And then they followed their leader. I was absolutely confused. I had followed the rules of fighting. I had behaved exactly the way I was supposed to behave. 
but these white boys had ignored the rules. In fact, they followed a whole other set of mysterious rules where apparently people did not get into fistfights. Wait! I called after Roger. What do you want? Roger said. What are the rules? What rules? I didn't know what to say, so I just stood there red and mute like a stop sign. Roger and his friends disappeared. I felt like somebody had shoved me into a rocket ship and blasted me to a new planet. I was a freaky alien, and there was absolutely no way to get home. This is a reading of The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian by Sherman Alexi. Um, make sure you follow along so that you can see the images that will not be described. This is Chapter 9, Grandmother Gives Me Some Advice. I went home that night completely confused and terrified. If I'd punched an Indian in the face, then he would have spent days plotting his revenge. And I imagined that white guys would also want revenge after getting punched in the face. So I figured Roger was going to run me over with a farm tractor or combine or combine, or grain truck, or runaway pig. I wished Rowdy was still my friend. I could have sent him after Roger. It would have been like King Kong battling Godzilla. I realized how much of my self-worth, my sense of safety, was based on Rowdy's fists. But Rowdy hated me. And Roger hated me. I was good at being hated by guys who could kick my ass. It's not a talent you really want to have. My mother and father weren't home, so I turned to my grandmother for advice. Grandma, I said. I punched this big guy in the face, and he just walked away. And now I'm afraid he's going to kill me. Why'd you punch him? She asked. He was bullying me. You should have just walked away. He called me chief and squaw boy. Then you should have kicked him in the balls. She pretended to kick a big guy in the crotch, and we both laughed. Did he hit you? She asked. No, not at all, I said. Not even after you hit him. Nope. And he's a big guy? Gigantic. I bet he could take Rowdy down. Wow, she said. It's strange, isn't it? I asked. What does it mean? Grandmother thought hard for a while. I think it means he respects you, she said. Respect? No way. Yes way. You see, you men and boys are like packs of wild dogs. This giant boy is the alpha male of the school, and you're the new dog, so he pushed you around a bit to see how tough you are. But I'm not tough at all, I said. Pause if you need more time. Yeah, but you punched the alpha in the face, she said. They're going to respect you now. I love you, Grandma, I said, but you're crazy. I couldn't sleep that night because I kept thinking about my impending doom. I knew Roger would be waiting for me in the morning at school. I knew he'd punch me in the head and shoulder area about 200 times. I knew I'd soon be in the hospital drinking soup through a straw. So, exhausted and terrified, I went to school. My day began as it usually did. I got out of bed at dark 30 and rummaged around the kitchen for that anything to eat. All I could find was a package of orange fruit drink mix, so I made a gallon of that and drank it all down. Then I went into the bedroom and asked Mom and Dad if they were driving me to school. Don't have enough da gas, Dad said, and he went back to sleep. Great. I'd have to walk. So I put on my shoes and coat and started down the highway. I got lucky because my dad's best friend, Eugene, just happened to be heading to Spokane. Eugene was a good guy and like an uncle to me, but he was drunk all the time. Not stinky drunk, just drunk enough to be drunk. He was funny and kind drunk, always wanting to laugh and hug you and sing songs and dance. Funny how the saddest guys can be happy drunks. Hey, Junior, he said. Hop on my pony, man. So I hopped onto the back of Eugene's bike, and off we went, barely in control. I just closed my eyes and held on. And pretty soon, Eugene got me to school. We pulled up in front, and a lot of my classmates just stared. I mean, Eugene had braids down to his butt, for one, and neither of us wore helmets for the other. I suppose we looked dangerous. Man, he said, there's a lot of white people here. Yeah. You doing all right with them? I don't know, I, I guess. It's pretty cool you doing this. He said, you think? Yeah, man. 
If I could never do it, I'm a wuss. Wow. I felt proud. Thanks for the ride, I said. You bet, Eugene said. He laughed and buzzed away. I walked up to the school and tried to ignore the stares of my classmates. And then I saw wa Roger walk out the front door. Man, I was going to have a fight. Shit, my whole life is a fight. Hey, Roger said. Hey, I said. Who was that on the bike? He asked. Oh, that was my dad's best friend. It was a cool bike, he said. Vintage. Yeah, he just got it. You ride with him a lot? Yes, I said. I lied. Cool, Roger said. Yeah, cool, I said. All right, then, he said. I'll see you around. And then he walked away. Wow, he didn't kick my ass. He was actually nice. He paid me some respect. He paid respect to Eugene and his bike. Maybe Grandma was right. Maybe I had challenged the alpha dog and was now being rewarded for it. I love my grandmother. She's the smartest person on the planet. Feeling almost like a human being, I walked into the school and saw Penelope the Beautiful. Hey, Penelope, I said, hoping that she knew I was now accepted by the dog pack. She didn't even respond to me. Maybe she hadn't heard me. Hey, Penelope, I said again. She looked at me and sniffed. She sniffed like I smelled bad or something. Do I know you? She said. There were only about 100 students in the whole school, right? So of course she knew me. She was just being a bitch. I'm Junior, I said. I mean, I'm Arnold. Oh, that's right, she said. You're the boy who can't figure out his own name. Her friends giggled. I was so ashamed. I might have impressed the king, but the queen still hated me. I guess my grandmother didn't know everything. This is a recording of the absolutely true story of a part-time Indian. Make sure you follow along to see any images. This is chapter 10, Tears of a Clown. When I was 12, I fell in love with an Indian girl named Dawn. She was tall and brown and was the tr best traditional powwow dancer on the res. Her braids, wrapped in otter fur, were legendary. Of course, she didn't care about me. She mostly made fun of me. She called me Junior High Honky for some reason I never understood. But that just made me love her even more. She was out of my league. And even though I was only 12, I knew that I'd be one of those guys who always fell in love with the unreachable, ungettable, and uninterested. One night, at about 2 in the morning, when Rowdy slept over at my house, I made a full confession. Man, I said, I love Dawn so much. He was pretending to be asleep on the floor of my room. Rowdy, I said, are you awake? No. Did you hear what I said? No. I said I love Dawn so much. He was quiet. Aren't you going to say anything? I asked. About what? About what I just said. I didn't hear you say anything. He was just screwing with me. Come on, Rowdy, I'm trying to tell you something major. You're just being stupid, he said. What's so stupid about it? Don doesn't give a shit about you, he said. And that made me cry. I've always cried too easily. I cry when I'm happy or sad. I cry when I'm angry. I cry because I'm crying. It's weak. It's the opposite of warrior. Quit crying, Rowdy said. I can't help it, I said. I love her so, her more than I've ever loved anybody. Yeah, I was quite the dramatic 12-year-old. Please, Rowdy said, stop that bawling, okay? Okay, okay, I said, I'm sorry. I wiped my face with one of my pillows and threw it across the room. Jesus, you're a wimp, Rowdy said. Just don't tell anybody I cried about Dawn, I said. Have I ever told anybody your secrets, Rowdy asked. No. Okay, then I won't tell anybody you cried over a dumb girl. And he didn't tell anybody. Rowdy was my secret keeper. This is a recording of the Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian by Sherman Alexi. Make sure you follow along for any pictures. Chapter 11, Halloween. At school today, I went dressed as a homeless dude. That's a pretty easy costume for me. 
There's not much difference between my good and bad clothes, so I pretty much look half homeless anyway. And Penelope went dressed as a homeless woman. Of course, she was the most beautiful homeless woman who ever lived. We made a cute couple. Of course, we weren't a couple at all, but I still found the need to comment on our common taste. Hey, I said, we have the same costume. I thought she was just going to sniff at me again, but she almost smiled. You have a good costume, Penelope said. You look really homeless. Thank you, I said. You look really cute. I'm not trying to be cute, she said. I'm wearing this to protest the treatment of homeless people in this country. I'm going to ask for only spare change tonight instead of candy, and I'm going to give it to all of the homeless. I didn't understand how wearing a Halloween costume could become a political statement. But I admired her commitment. I wanted her to admire my commitment, too, so I lied. Well, I said, I'm wearing this to protest the treatment of homeless Native Americans in the country. Oh, she said, I guess that's pretty cool. Yeah, that spare change thing is a good idea. I think I might do that, too. Of course, after school, I'd be trick-or-treating on the res, so I wouldn't collect as much spare change as Penelope would in Reardon. Hey, I said, why don't we pool our t money tomorrow and send it together? We'd be able to give twice as much. Penelope stared at me. She studied me. I think she was trying to figure out if I was serious. Are you for real? She asked. Yes, I said. Well... Okay, she said. It's a deal. Cool, 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 I said. So later that night, I went out trick-or-treating on the res. It was a pretty stupid idea, I guess. I was probably too old to be trick-or-treating, if an, even if I was asking for spare change for the homeless. Oh, plenty of people were happy to give me spare change, and more than a few of them gave me candy and spare change. And my dad was home and sober, and he gave me a dollar. He was almost always home and sober and generous on Halloween. A few we few folks, especially the grandmothers, thought I was a brave little dude for going to a white school. But there were a lot more people who just called me names and slammed the door in my face. And I didn't even consider what other kids might do to me. About 10 o'clock as I was walking home, three guys jumped me. I couldn't tell who they were. They all wore Frankenstein masks. And they shoved me to the ground and kicked me a few times and spit on me. I could handle the kicks, but the spit made me feel like an insect, like a slug, like a sled burning to death from salty spit. They didn't beat me up too bad. I could tell they didn't want to put me in the hospital or anything. Mostly, they just wanted to remind me that I was a traitor, and they wanted to steal my candy and the money. It wasn't much, maybe ten bucks in coins and dollar bills. But that money and the idea of giving it to poor people had made me feel pretty good about myself. I was a poor kid, raising money for other poor people. It made me feel almost honorable. But I just felt stupid and naive after those guys took off. I lay there in the dirt and remembered how Rowdy and I used to trick-or-treat together. We'd always wear the same costume. And I knew that if I'd been with him, I never would have gotten assaulted. And then I wondered if Rowdy was one of the guys who just beat me up. Damn, that would be awful. But I couldn't believe it. I wouldn't believe it. No matter how much he hated me, Roddy would never hurt me that way. Never. At least, I hoped he'd never hurt me. The next morning at school, I walked up to Penelope and showed her my empty hands. I'm sorry, I said. Sorry for what? She asked. I raised money last night, but then some guys attacked me and stole it. Oh my god, are you okay? Yeah, they just kicked me a few times. Oh my god, where did they kick you? I lifted up my shirt and showed her the bruises on my belly and ribs and back. That's terrible! Did you see a doctor? Oh, they're not so bad, I said. That one looks like it really hurts, she said, and touched a fingertip to the huge purple bruise on my back. I almost fainted. Her touch felt good. I'm sorry they did that to you, she said. I'll still put your name on the money when I send it. Wow, I said. That's really cool. Thank you. You're welcome, she said, and walked away. I was just going to let her go, but I had to say something memorable, something huge. Hey, I called after her. What, she asked. It feels good, doesn't it? What feels good? It feels good to help people, doesn't it? I asked. Yes, she said. Yes, it does. She smiled. Of course, after that little moment, I thought that Penelope and I would become closer, 
I thought she'd start paying more attention to me, and that everybody, everybody else would notice me, and then I'd become the most popular dude in the place. But nothing much changed. I was still a stranger in a strange land, and Penelope still treated me pretty much the same. She didn't really say much to me, and I didn't really say much to her. I wanted to ask Rowdy for advice. Hey, buddy, I would have said. How do I make a beautiful white girl fall in love with me? Well, buddy, he would have said, the first thing you have to do is change the way you look, the way you talk, and the way you walk. And then she'll think you're frickin' Prince Charming. <laughs>